Once again, good evening, good luck, and so forth. Uh, without any further ado, I plunge right into the material, which is the name of the series is, of course, Hubris and Atonement, the State of Israel, Jewish People in 1972 to 75. And tonight, the third lecture called Cogs in the Cold War, Israel in the Age of Nixon's Detente. So, as I said, let's plunge right into this. We're dealing over here with the early 70s. That's what we call the age of Nixon. He dominated, for better or worse, you know, some like him, some don't like him, but he dominated uh, world events, uh, and uh, therefore, it's part of Israel's uh, history. Now, Nixon was a very unusual person, as I started to speak about last year. He was definitely a chant of the good and the bad, right? There was no, no question about it. I, I'm gonna tell you something, you see this picture over here? He didn't know it's being taken. They had some handicapped child, and he really gave full attention. It's amazing, you see? On the other hand, you also had this guy, so will the real person, so to speak, stand? That's what makes him so interesting to historians. You know, how can a person do this, person that? Of course, the truth of the matter is historians study the human uh, species, and that's what we're humanists. And as we think the most interesting thing people out there are people, and the same person can be good and bad, and bad and good and smart and dumb and dumb and smart. It's, a, it's, it's interesting that way. And now, there's a perception, myth, whatever, of Nixon on one hand, and there's a perhaps a more sophisticated uh, understanding. Nixon was elected as a conservative, but he wasn't a conservative. It's a very common misconception. Uh, Reagan was a conservative. I repeat, uh, uh, by the way, a brand new book, very interesting book by Pat Buchanan came out just now, one of the years of the Nixon administration. He's complaining, and he loved Nixon. He's complaining they were not a conservative. It's absolutely true, okay? Um, Nixon was perhaps in some ways more prepared to be president than many others, because he had been eight years vice president under Eisenhower. Um, what <coughs> training, for example, did Clinton have? He was the governor of Arkansas. What training did Bush have? He owned a football team. What training did Obama have as a community organizer? What training did Trump have? I'm not even going to go there. And, 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 and wait a second. And, 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 and Nixon, you can say like this, had been a congressman, had been a senator, been vice president of the United States, he got a lot of experience on the rise. I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, it's just interesting. And he knew the White House inside out that way. And therefore he gave, had given a great deal of thought of how the presidency should uh, run. To the dismay of his conservative base, as soon as he became president, Nixon appointed two Harvard liberal professors to the two commanding positions, jobs in his administration in January of 1969. He put in Moynihan in charge of all domestic policy and Kissinger in charge of foreign policy. Both of these guys were Harvard liberal professors. Let's get over that, okay? So this is very interesting. It's not the type of person you would imagine will be put in in a conservative administration. You know, uh, Kissinger had been a Rockefeller Republican, if you recall, which was the left wing of the Republican Party. Uh, now, Moynihan, uh, they're both brilliant intellectuals, but that's not my point. Point is, where do you stand in terms of policy and perspective on the political spectrum? Now, uh, Moynihan was very interesting. Uh, he was there for a year or something like that, and he got Nixon prepared to, 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 to suggest an increase in the welfare, which, you know, considered to freak out. Maybe people don't remember anymore, the FAP. Basically, Nixon's like this. Let's get rid of welfare and just give everybody a guaranteed national income. That time, 20 grand. 20 grand over there is like what today? Yeah, six. Imagine give everybody, including immigrants and this and that and the other, just give them 60 grand, and then you have no welfare programs. Uh, that's like a naughty idea, but Moynihan sold it to him, okay? Now, um, when that didn't work, and a couple other ideas didn't work, Moynihan was out. But, uh, but not before he had effected some extremely important liberal measures during the administration of Richard Milhouse Nixon. Nixon desegregated the public schools. Johnson passed the law, but he didn't desegregate the schools. As you look it up, you'll see. Uh, Nixon started the affirmative action. Not Johnson, that's right, you know, that's what I'm telling you. There's the, you know, general mythological perception, and then there's the facts. Uh, now, Moynihan was tossed out, not Kissinger, okay? The opposite. Even though Nixon and Kissinger didn't like each other, uh, they had, came from a very different background, but as we all know, as the administration proceeded, they got ever closer, ever tighter. It's a really, just a fascinating human being story. And uh, just as in domestic policy, Nixon turned out not to be the anti-welfare, anti-civil rights conservative to the dismay of his conservative base. 
so too in foreign policy, Nixon turned out not to be the super anti-communist cold warrior he seemed to be when he was running. Right? And once again, from the Reaganist perspective, or the more right wing of the Republican Party, uh, which as we know in our lifetime became the, the heart of the Republican Party, uh, Reagan was the conservative. I mean, he was the you know, cold warrior, not, not Nixon. Now, back when he was young, uh, Richard Nixon, who became vice president of the United States at the age of 39. I tell you, there's a lot of things that people don't realize. Nixon and Eisenhower, when they were running in the first time in the early 50s, they attacked the Truman foreign policy as soft on communism. His famous uh, speech, out with the Dean Atchison and College of the Cowardly Containment of Communism. Now, Truman was a pretty doggone anti-communist, so this is all election stuff. And it was all baloney, okay? Because <laughs> wait, wait. Truman wasn't strong enough, so what do you want to do, World War? You get it? Like, you know, what's that all about? After eight years as vice president and another eight years in the 60s living through Vietnam and what it was doing to the social fabric of American society, Nixon, by the time he came into office in 69, had become like Ashton and Truman, knows he can't have a we can't roll back communism and, 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 and ignite the Cold War. In fact, Nixon went in the liberal direction way past Truman and Atchison. He did things they would never dream of doing. During the 1960s, there's reasons for this. American culture was obsessed with nuclear weapons. Do you remember Dr. Strangelove? The guys are going to drop a bomb on Russia right now. It was a mistake. That the whole point of the movie, the, the, the story is, is a miscommunication. But, but the Air Force guys are real good, and he'll be moister and effish to drop an H-bomb on Russia. And then what's that going to do to the world? Okay, that was an iconic cultural moment. He's the Air Force guy, pilot. Remember the Strategic Air Command? Now what's the point, now by the way, it's a piece of art. Nothing like this, what, what's, what's the cultural message? World War III is around the corner. You know, we, we, we're that close away to the world blowing up, you see? Does anybody remember, let's go to the next one. Does anybody remember the movie Failsafe? Same thing. There's a whole bunch of books, novels, movies, and so forth. Now by the way, there are none of those in the 70s. You got used to it. You had other problems. I'm just trying to show you. I'm always interested in a movie, not for the movies. I'm always interested in movies, expression of historical cultural moments. To me, there's always Kodak moment, if that means anything to this generation. Of, uh, I say Kodak moment, my kids say, what was that? They think I'm talking about a polar bear. The, um, the um, um, uh, screen shows you what people are. Thank you. Does anybody old enough remember when you dug, you're supposed to dig your own bomb shelter? <laughs> a lot of good that's going to do. Or were you in school when they told you to sit under your desk? And, so, wait a minute. That put a different perspective on the question of war and peace. Okay? And Nixon's part of that generation. Henry Kissinger became famous as a young man writing about the use of tactical nukes in the 1950s. This is the book that put him on the front page. He was like a little schnook. You know, it was just a junior professor at Harvard that, and this really put him in, in, in with the government, with the elites. So these guys lived the world of possible nuclear war in a way that you and I don't today. I mean, we know it's there, it's just, we, we, we've gotten used to it, you understand? We, we, we live with it. Now, there were two schools of thought among the American elites that had gelled during the late 40s, 50s, and 60s. Two schools of thought. One was the Atchison Dulles Reagan School of Thought. That's the hard line. It's very thoughtful. And what they said was like this. Let me put it this way. It's based on the thinking of George Kennan, who was a very famous, brilliant American diplomat. Okay, one of the most brilliant. Uh, George Kennan 
had, was, a, was, a, was in the, Russian, the American embassy in Russia for many years. And he knew Russia, he studied Russia all his life. And he, in 1946, he wrote, it's called the, the, the Long Telegram. This is spelled wrong, but anyway, the, the Long Telegram, in which he analyzed brilliantly was Tutsik with Russia, and he said like this, they're, they're never going to change, they're out to conquer the world, they have a totally uh, uh, um, closed system in which all they want to do is be t a complete dictatorship. So what does America do? The only thing you can do is contain it. Now let's try to, uh, uh, don't go to war, but build up situations of strength to match the Russians, then they won't make a war. And if you wait long enough, the internal contradictions from within the system will cause Russia to implode. Because at the end of the day, they can't deliver to their own people. The whole thing is based on a house of cards. But it takes a long time for that to happen. And so hold the line. Make no concessions to Russia. Do not help their economy. Starve the beast. Right? Uh, no, it was the Reagan policy. But that was not at all the policy of Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and Ford, and Carter. Okay, it was, let's go to the next one. These guys did not follow that policy. Okay. Uh, they said, because of their worried about World War III and things like that, and anyway, the American uh, nature of our body politic is such that we don't feel comfortable with this kind of static uh, policy, and everybody persuaded themselves we can ameliorate, we can make Russia better, we can improve little by little. If we have cultural exchanges, you know, they'll become a little more open, and all, you know, the system can, can, can somehow, which better. Which was, was a lie, but not 100% a lie, okay? Because, you know, a little bit of an opening of the system was there. But in the long run, with our perspective today, and that's a good thing about historians, we can talk about dead people long after they're dead, so we know who's right and who's wrong. You know, Kennan was right, because in the end, Russia, Imploded from within because of the internal contradictions of the communist system because they couldn't deliver toilet paper to the people, even though they could have an H bomb by the dozens. And more importantly, the, uh, the lie of communism, because it was a lie from day one, it was a big lie. I know many of your relatives believe in that stuff, but it was a big lie from, 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 from day one. There wasn't a shred of truth to it. In the long run, the, the, the um, ideological message of communism came to be bankrupt. And by the time it came to Brezhnev, these guys, it's just a bunch of old guys holding on to power in a bureaucratic, uh, you know, dictatorship way so that they can live a good life and the others not. And the joke is, they don't even live as good a life as a capitalist. You know what I mean? In other words, they have to pull a whole system to buy caviar. Yeah, and you can go buy it, you know, at the drop of a hat. So, Kennan was right in the long run, but that's not what American history played out. Most of the administrations wanted to pursue, in one form or another, an easing of relations, an improvement of relations, not too much, but not too little, and what they call in French the détente, which means, you know, you have your system, we have our system, it's, it, we don't want a fail-safe movie, we don't want a Doctor Strange love movie, we want better communication between the two sides, and an easing of the situation such as if anything ever pops up, we can talk about it and discuss it like rational people, actors, and it'll never get to the point that this one's actually pulling the missiles out of the silo or something like that. That's the idea. It makes sense. And there were even um, constant pressures on the part of big business, which is natural, to say, you know, let's uh, trade with Russia and we can do business prospects. Now, this was stupid. From day one, Russia don't pay a penny. And what they want is America and the West should give them credits. So you lend me the money and I'll buy your stuff. Which is another way of give me a present. And this country did to a certain extent give them some money and so did the others, never saw it, never will. Okay. Uh, but I'm trying to share with you the intellectual atmosphere of the elites of America because they're the only ones that made the foreign policy. Okay. Very small group, relative population, hundreds of millions of people were actors in this kind of business. So uh, it's just very interesting. Eisenhower, the great general, started and tried detente after Dulles died, uh, but it didn't work out. Look at this. I, 
I understand. I understand. I get it. Stop it for a second. Yeah. Now you'll see in a second, Khrushchev came over here, but he got angry they wouldn't let him to Disneyland. You understand? And so you'll see he's screaming at Marilyn Monroe, you know, so they won't let me into Disneyland. This is the World War Three. you understand? And so the whole thing later, let's show him. All I can tell you, it's also true that they captured Francis Gary Powers, and then, you know, he said, oh, there's a U2, so we, but the bottom line is, Eisenhower tried, it didn't work. Kennedy and Johnson tried in the 60s, each one their own, a lot. Uh, I'm going to go through the details, and it failed, okay? When Nixon gets elected early 69, and the Vietnam War is in a bad way, he signals the Russian ambassador, De Brinin, who was the ambassador here for 20-some years, through Henry Kissinger, we really mean business. We want to have a daytime. We want to, you know, in other words, we'll, we'll horse trade. You give this up, we'll give that up, and so forth. Nixon desperately wanted Soviet help to pull out of the Vietnam quagmire. Right? The U.S. had a half a million men in Vietnam. They had no way or no plan to win. They wanted to get out in such a way that they wanted at least what you call a decent interval. So he said, let, let them make peace and let us pull all out from South Vietnam. And then what happens happens like that. And that way it'll be, uh, you know, better for America. Um, and you're the Russians, so you can, you know, all the communists listen to you or something like that, so you help. All during 1969, 70 and 71, the Soviets, Kid Darkum, smiled, but twisted the blade. They give Russia, uh, Vietnam, more weapons and they encourage them to stay. Why not? Basically, if a person said like this, oh, we're suffering over here, will you help me? Who are you asking, oppressive? <laughs> That's how it works over there. You know, in that country you say, oh, I'm dying, this guy's good, <laughs> I'll take your money, you know. It's, 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 it's a different mentality. So, again, collapsing a lot together, Nixon, who was very frustrated, finally came up with a way out. China, that's how it happened. I can't, don't work through Russia, let's go through China. China and Russia were mortal enemies in Nixon's time. We didn't know this, most of us, but there was a war. I mean, boom, 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 battles. Going, going between the Russian army and the Chinese army over here, you know, not, this is not far from the uh, uh, Pacific. In this area of, um, what's it called, uh, uh, Siberia, Kamchatka and so forth. Uh, the Sino-Soviet border conflict, seven month undeclared military conflict in, in 69, when Nixon was the president. I remember, you know, I was younger obviously, I was remember reading a little bit, but I had no idea, it was like a mamish a war going on, you know. And although military clashes Ceased that year, the underlying issue was not resolved till later on and they'll never be resolved. The most serious, March of 69, in this area, Domensky Island, whatever, uh, what they call the conflict of such and such, meaning it was a, it was a war going on. Ad Kedekach that Russia informally asked Nixon, um, will you step aside if we nuke China? Now. He said, no, you can't do that. I'm not sure he did the right thing or not, but, but, that, but that's what happened. It's just interesting. Of course, Nixon wasn't a total dummy. He said to the Chinese, by the way, Russia said we should stay away. In other words, you twist the blade on me, I get to you like that. Yeah, you do, we do can play at that game. So we're back to the Borgias, you know. Anyhow, um, basically, Nixon, who had been very widely traveled, 
I mean, he'd been to most countries. He knew the world. This was one of his big pluses. He realized China wants Siberia back, and, and, and Nixon knows this, and they still do. And one day, remember where you heard it, uh, China will get Siberia back because I think there's 8 million Russians there, that's all. They've never really uh, done anything with Siberia. And, and that's a whole schmooze by itself, I'll leave it aside. But if you're China with a couple of zillion people here and you see 8 million over here, you tell me what's going to happen. But you know, the Chinese take the long view. Doesn't have to be the century. You know, maybe, it, we'll, we'll see sooner or later Russia will screw up and then they'll take the whole thing and then they'll double. That's the real plan. You know, I don't think they're looking so much to expand it to India. Who needs that? Uh, virgin territory. You understand? Uh, uh, put, put a billion Chinese up there. You double the country, get all the resources, then China will be the world power. That's, that's the world as they see it. Isn't it funny? This is basic facts of geopolitics, and all you know is what did Trump say yesterday in a tweet. You know what I'm saying? You know, the, the news is, is, is dumb here. Anyhow, in mid-1971, so Nixon had been president in 69, 70, 71, after a lot of secret diplomacy, Kissinger and all that, they pulled it off, and Nixon shocked the world. Remember this? It was a real, because we were. I have requested this television time tonight to announce a major development in our efforts to build a lasting peace in the world. As I have pointed out on a number of occasions over the past three years, there can be no stable and enduring peace without the participation of the People's Republic of China and its 750 million people. That is why. I have undertaken initiatives in several areas to open the door for more normal relations between our two countries. In pursuance of that goal, I sent Dr. Kissinger, my assistant for national security affairs, to Peking during his recent world tour for the purpose of having talks with Premier Chouinard. The announcement I shall now read is being issued simultaneously in Peking and in the United States. That's it. And by the way, kids, I will, I'm not going to give you the whole speech. Nixon goes on saying this. This is not against Russia at all. <laughs> <laughs> he says, oh, says this, is, no, this is nothing against Russia. So, of course, the Russians were shocked. This, the, from their point of view, it's the worst nightmare. I said, well, why did you mess America over to push them into this? The Russians can't help being who they are any more than we can help be who we are. You understand? Know when they see somebody to kick, they kick. That they can't help it. And so uh, the Russians were shocked at these pictures because Nixon went in February of 72, election year, election year. And this was, you know, the big, uh, you know, uh, uh, event. What did Nixon gain? Well, it's, that's complicated. He hoped China would help end the Vietnam War. But it turned out that it wasn't a vort in China, it was a vort in Russia. China, Vietnam and China actually hated each other, it turned out. They, if you remember, they had a war a couple years in the late 70s, okay? So he thought, all these Chinese guys look alike, you know, it was like that. <laughs> That's who Nixon was, you know. That, 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 that. Let me tell you something, at the end of the day, the racism is a big factor in the world politics. China is the same racism. America, England, you know, it's, all, it's all the same to them. It, 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 maybe it shouldn't be, maybe it shouldn't be. That's how the world works. And so, um, it didn't really help them out, and Nixon actually said before he died, maybe I created Frankenstein, because what do we owe China? A zillion, trillion dollars? Right, you know? On the other hand, with Trump, I always say the Chinese must be shaking, because he might say like this, chapter 11, you know? <laughs> He's the guy to do it, man. Uh, now, what it did gain was to say to Russia, without saying it, if war breaks out between America and Russia, China will join inside of America which was Russia's big nightmare. So what was the Russian reaction, the Soviet reaction? What they, they're basically bullies, you understand? And so, that's what they, they're bullies. So that means you respect strength. So they're saying, oh, we're all, all outraged, and Nixon, this and that and the other, want to put you in Khirim. They said, we invite you to Moscow. <laughs> if you're going to Peking, come to Russia, make a deal with us. And so Nixon, in the election year, gets to go in February, Think about the TV. It goes February to China, and in May to Moscow to do the SALT Treaty. You know, he's reducing the level of nuclear weapons. Oh my God, you know? And you have all these things where he's kissing up 
look, look how him and Brezhnev are, uh, who really hate each other, are all budding up like it's making a, a, a Laurel and Hardy. You'll see, you'll see. Laurel Hardy. It's actors. And, and the next day, Nixon gave a famous speech on Russian television. Boy, did he lay it on thick. This is Nixon in Russia on the Soviet TV. He's very good at that, you know. That's enough. It doesn't even matter what he says. It's the image. Nixon and the Kremlin, you know. So uh, what was the result of all this uh, stuff? The American people loved these images. You remember and I remember it. Because after we saw such a world of hostility and, and uh, Dr. Strange in Vietnam and all the rest of it, this, this, this was considered to be something good. And um, the world tremendously respected Nixon. He was always thought of very highly in Europe and Asia and places like that, much more than here. Okay, so this was his uh, strong suit. And of course, it won him the election, right? Now, the Democrats put the worst possible guy on there, McGovern, who you know, had no chance whatsoever, who was from the extreme left of the party. Now, today, Bernie Sanders represents a large constituency. At that time, it was a different world. You understand? And so when, when McGovern came in without going through all the details, it led to the number one defeat in American political history. Look at the map. Every state went for the... Only Massachusetts. It's the number one landslide in American history. Nixon won every doggone state, except for Massachusetts and D.C. That's right. Okay. No, I'm telling you, every every. I mean, look at the map. It says it everything. So, um, wow. Okay, my friends. Now we ask ourselves the following question: How does Israel fit in all this? Okay. Uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, knows Israel very well, turns out. First of all, he had a very good bar mitzvah teacher. Okay? Uh, you, you don't know what I'm talking about. In 1959, Ben-Gurion went to Washington, you know, to talk to Eisenhower. And while he was there, he also visited a number of VIPs. And Ben-Gurion figured like this, Nixon might be president next time, you know? And so he went to pay a visit on uh, Nixon, uh, to Nixon's house. We're very uh, Nixon's daughter, Nixon's like, come on in. This is my daughter, Julie. She was in third grade, something like that, fourth grade, fifth grade, in public school. At that time, it was a good public school. And they had a, a teacher, gave them multicultural assignment. At that time, multicultural assignment, right on this. What's a bar mitzvah? She don't know, huh? bar mitzvah. So happens, <laughs> Ben Gurion, he sat down with her an hour and a half. Look, he's no dummy. And he gave her a whole gun to business and so forth. When she came to school, this Nixon writes this, I'm not saying, Nixon writes it. She came to school, the teacher says, this is unusually well, I think. He says, what, you didn't put your sewers, you know, what's your sewers? David Ben-Gurion, the prime minister. Is, you know? So, you know, when, when, if you could, so if you get a, there's a bar mitzvah lessons, there's a bar mitzvah lessons. Anyway, uh, furthermore, Nixon always had this very interesting, you can go Jekyll and Hyde type uh, relationship. Here in the White House tapes, you hear him say, the damn Jews and this and that and the other, which he, of course he did do. But so what? Uh, is his girlfriend. 
You, 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 can't, you can't deny it. He, he, him and Goldemir got on very well, and he delivered. He delivered. So which is the real thing? You know, if you're the type of person that says, as is common today, so if you ever said any remark whatsoever about Jews, that immediately brands you as a Hitlerist. If you're that kind of individual, then there's nothing you can say about Nixon. But if you are a different sort of individual and say, let me look at the whole picture, people are very complicated in that way. And as I, you know and I know, at the end when, when the chips were down, Nixon helped Israel. Okay? And I might say in the, when, during his administration, nobody else did. Okay? So how do you explain all that? Uh, Kissinger, after he left office, wrote a memoirs, and it's very interesting, uh, it's a little self-serving of course, but nevertheless, a very interesting extended passage on what he considered uh, Kissinger, uh, Nixon and the Jews and so on and so forth. It should be up on the screen so you'll follow it as I read it because I think it's, wor it it's worth for me to uh, read a page. And it says, of course, my relationship with Nixon never easy, was in any event more complex with respect to the Middle East than with other issues. Nixon was convinced that he owed nothing to Jewish votes and that he could not increase his Jewish support regardless of what he did, because the Jews aren't voting for Nixon. And what he deep down wanted to do was impose a comprehensive settlement sometime during his term in office. Many of his comments, written and oral, testified to this visceral attitude. In October of 72, I forwarded to Nixon a memorandum from Melvin Laird, Secretary of Defense, urging secret contacts with Egypt to take, uh, to take advantage of Sadat's expulsion of Soviets and move closer to the Arab position. Right? Nixon sent back the, memory, the mem uh, memorandum with a note, Kissinger, I lean to Laird's view, the conduct of the American Jewish community on the Soviet visa problem clearly indicates that they put Jewish interests above US concerns and this we cannot do. Now, I'm going to take, talk about that later in this series. Such comments by Nixon were as frequent as he was unlikely to act on them. Those is a, is a bark, not a bite. I mention them here because to omit them would falsify the historical record, but also because they illustrate the strange symbiotic relationship between the president and his advisor, meaning Kissinger. Starting from the opposite end of the emotional spectrum with regard to Israel, we came together on policies and strategies because of a similar perception of the national interest. Nixon shared many of the prejudices of the uprooted California lower middle class from where he had come, as a real Harvard professor talking. He believed that Jews formed a powerful, cohesive group in American society, that they were predominantly liberal, that they put the interests of Israel above those of everything else, and then on the whole, they were more sympathetic to the Soviet Union than other ethnic groups, that their control of the media made them dangerous adversaries, above all, that Israel had to be forced into a peace settlement and could not be permitted to jeopardize our Arab relations. None of this kept them from having cordial personal relations with many individual Jews and elevating them in his administration to key positions. Indeed, personally, he sometimes seemed especially at ease with representatives of a group that shared with him the experience of being outsiders. So I'll tell you, you know, it's, 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 it's complicated. His prejudices would break forth in some of his commands, reflecting the emotion of the moment, which his assistants and associates knew better than to implement. He never returned to them. So he blew up and then it went away. I did not keep track of how often I was told to cut off all aid to Israel in retaliation for the actions of some wayward Jewish members of Congress. Senator Javits really got under his skin. As late as three days before his resignation, he issued such an order. Haig and I decided to draft the directive, but to hold it for the new president to, resi to, to, to resign or not. Of course, Ford did not. Equally frequent were instructions to convey some communist moral transgression to the Jewish leaders as if Jews needed special instructions and the evils of communism. And yet, when all was said and done, in every crisis, Nixon stood by Israel more firmly than any president except for Harry Truman. <laughs> he admired Israeli guts. He respected Israeli leaders' tenacious defense of their national interest. He considered their military prowess an asset for the democratic world. Though convinced that Israel's occupation of Arab territories strengthened anti-Western radical forces, he was sophisticated enough to understand that the reverse was not true. 
pressuring Israel in concert with radical forces was more likely to further Soviet than Western interests. And in crises, whenever his calculation, whatever his calculation of who was ultimately at fault, Nixon never lost sight of his priorities. He understood that we could not mediate effectively until it was clear that our actions had not been exhorted by Soviet pressure. So at the end of the day, by a different route, Nixon came to the same conclusion as I, that the American national interest required a demonstration of Soviet and radical inability to achieve Arab objectives, and that no progress could be made until at least moderate Arabs were willing to make a piece of genuine compromise. My own starting point, this is Kissinger, was at the other end of the emotional spectrum. Though not practicing my religion, I could never forget that 13 members of my family were killed by Hitler in the concentration camp. I had no stomach for encouraging another Holocaust by well-intentioned policies that might get out of control. Most Israeli leaders were personal friends of mine. And yet, like Nixon, I had to subordinate my emotional preferences to my perception of the national American interest. Indeed, given the historical suspicions towards my religion, I had a special obligation to do so. It was not always easy, and occasionally it proved painful, but Israel's security could be preserved in the long run only by anchoring it to the strategic interest of the United States, not to sentiments of individuals. And on this basis, this unlikely pair, the communist Bater from South California and the refugee from Nazi Germany, joined hands to break at last the deadlock of Middle East diplomacy. Well, there you go. This is complicated. <laughs> See, don't give me any black and white, you know, stupid superficial analyses. Okay, so where do we go with this? Um, Nixon and Kissinger were not friends. As I told you before, there are books about this, movies even. The White House was a snake pit under Nixon, especially the first administration for the Watergate. You know, hold them in Ehrlichman. This one, each one's trying to stab the other in the back, because that's the kind of atmosphere that Nixon felt comfortable in. Uh, he did. Uh, Kissinger was not his friend. Nixon had a Jewish friend. This guy, Leonard Garment, who was a special counsel and assistant to the president. Leonard Garment was a Brooklyn boy who went to Brooklyn Law School, no fancy school, and, and, and was in the law firm that Nixon was in before he became president in uh, Manhattan. In other words, after he lost to JFK during the years before he was elected president, he was uh, practicing law. Nixon was a lawyer. Um, he didn't like practicing law. You know, it didn't turn him on but he was very good at it. Um, Nixon, as a, I'll, I'll, just as a matter of fact, when he was in high school, uh, he, you know, he went to a local college, that's right. He went to a local college, Whittier. He got accepted to Harvard Law School, but he couldn't afford the money. You see? So he went to Duke, because they gave a, a scholarship. Just, you know, it was no dummy. And he was, a, and, and when he was in private practice, he argued a bunch of times, among other places, in front of the United States Supreme Court. And he won a bunch of cases. So he had his kaiches, let's put it that way. And this guy, Leonard Garment, was a member of the firm and became uh, close friends, to the degree that Nixon had any friends. He didn't have any friends, but you know. To, no, I'm serious. He once wrote a book. He said, my 75 best friends. You know, I got news for you if you got 75 best friends. <laughs> you know, many. But, uh, but nevertheless, uh, that's the guy, let's put it this way, when Israel wanted to get a message to Nixon, they didn't call Kissinger. They called this guy. And he did do it. Okay? He was a liberal. I told you before, Nixon was not exactly a conservative. He had many liberals on the staff. And he was one of the main ones. And he's the main guy for the public TV. National Endowment for the Arts and all that. He made the Channel 67. That's him. So um, Nixon made it clear that although he does not support Israel's annexing territory, he does support Israel's right to exist. Now, Golda Meir was a maximalist when it came to territory. During the period I'm speaking of, before the Yom Kippur War, she said Israel needs to hold on to every piece. Take a look at this.
this treaty to any one of our neighbors. We must have borders that are defensible, and we ask for changes in borders. We say these borders, new borders, must serve two purposes. First, if and when we are attacked again, we should be able to defend ourselves. But maybe something which is even more important than that, and that is that the foreigners in themselves must be a deterrent for any more shooting. That any Arab leader at any time looks at the borders, they shouldn't be so inviting for him to begin shooting. That he should think twice, ten times, is it worthwhile to defend, to attack Israel again, since it has these borders, which are difficult to cross. That's enough. She, I mean, let's put it there. She's very eloquent, you know. She said, we, "So what she's saying, we want to hold on to everything." I mean, that's the bottom line, right? Now Nixon was a minimalist, okay, because he had friends besides Israel, right? The United States has the Arabs. Now half the Arab world was for Russia at that time, but the other half was it, like Jordan and Saudi Arabia and so forth was on our side. And so it's not push it. How do you balance out that, the, especially the oil-producing countries and things that should be? Friendly, basically friendly to America. He can't say that we endured. He felt can't say that you know Israel should keep the Sinai, keep everything, and expect the other Arab countries to be friends with America. So it's uh, tricky. But even as a minimalist, Nixon did agree on an irreducible minimum. He was very clear about this to Arab uh, distress. Now I remember, but I couldn't find it online. It's funny what sticks in your mind. Uh, a different age of journalism. I can't stand to watch any of this stuff now. It's all about get you, you know, and the, the, all these stupid questions. <coughs> but when I was young and when you were young, Sam, uh, there was uh, a period in which people just asked questions about policy. And I remember, as a kid, of course, I was younger. So were you, I think. That, um, some I'm not sure. He says, I, I remember that was Nixon and Eric Severide and uh, you know Howard K. Smith, those type of people that were not out to do tricky things, just find out what the policy is. And they interviewed Nixon on the foreign policy, including the Middle East. And I, was very, I remember I was, like, I was very impressed because he was well prepared and he really answered and had nothing to do with stupid politics. Or what is the American policy, the foreign policy, on the Vietnam, on the NATO, on the this, on that, and what about the Middle East? And I couldn't find it online, but I found the transcript in the New York Times. And take a look at this. This is Nixon, where the guy said, what, you know, George Ball wrote last week that the Russian, oh, that's the Vietnam. Uh, here we go. I think the Middle East now. <coughs> you hear the, the reporters are saying, what about the Middle East? It's very dangerous. This is Nixon talking. Like the Balkans before World War I were two superpowers, the U.S. and Russia could draw in a confrontation. Neither one was because of the differences there. I remember him saying this. What happened in World War I? The whole thing was stupid. They shot the Archduke which was a Yugoslavian Serbian business. You know what happened, the whole thing spun out of control. Germany and, 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 and France and Russia and England all went to each other over something that was not no gain to them, they didn't really care about. You understand? So nuclear or superpowers have emotions. And he said, you know, the Middle East is something. America and Russia could get into a war over the Arab-Israeli conflict and neither of us want to do that. And so we have to be extremely careful how we proceed, we and the Russians, in this war. He's absolutely right about that. And he said, now what should the United States policy be? I'll summarize in one word, peace, integrity of every country in the area. We recognize Israel. The US recognizes Israel. Israel's not desirous of driving them into the sea. They want to drive Israel into the sea. So that's basic fact number one, is an asymmetric uh, conflict. You're trying to kill me, I'm not trying to kill you. And then once the balance of power shifts to where Israel's weaker, there's going to be a war. So it's America's interest to maintain the balance of power, and we will maintain the balance of power. So you know, it's a very intelligent kind of approach. Now, I'm not supporting that Israel should hold up to the Sinai, and I'm not supporting that Israel should do this and all that. But basic, Israel needs. So if Russia gives them a thousand planes, we've got to give them planes to, back, to, to manage it. Not because we're trying to make Israel go conquer the Arabs, but we're trying to prevent the Arabs from wiping out Israel. See? So he's very clear. Uh, I think, on what this is. Now, privately, 
he uh, criticized the Israelis for inflexibility. Oh, good. There's more. That's why the Soviet Union supports Egypt, the UAR, and makes it necessary for us to do whatever Russia does. And once that balance of power is upset, we are going to do whatever is necessary to maintain Israel's strength vis-a-vis -vis the Arabs. Not because we want Israel in a position to wage war, that's not it, but because this will deter the neighbors from attacking it, or at least they thought. The diplomacy is terribly difficult because Israel's neighbors have to recognize Israel's right to exist. Israel, on the other hand, should withdraw to its borders, but borders that are defensible. Now that's, uh, uh, as we call in the Gemara, Tarte de Sasra, you know, how do you work that out? But in other words, at least he was trying to articulate a policy in which he said we support Israel's right to exist, even though we're, we're telling the Arabs we don't support Israel's right to expand. And we consider all these factors and throw in that Russia is now moving Mediterranean, you said why this is so complex, but we're going to continue to work on it. You can be sure we have Vietnam. doesn't mean we've given up every other uh, uh, attention to the Middle East as well. So he spoke it very intelligently, as I say before. Um, now, uh, let's put it this way. Privately, behind doors, he said, Israel is terrible. They, they're inflexible and all the rest of it. But that's letting off steam. You know, the Jews, this, the Jews, and that. But publicly, Nixon, especially Kissinger, viewed the Arab-Israeli conflict through the prism of the Cold War. Since the Arabs are in with Russia, America's interest to show, to demonstrate that such a policy of being friends with Russia will not, not help them beat Israel. Otherwise, Russia will have a total triumph in the Middle East. Do, do you get the idea? The message has to be that only Nixon can deliver Israel. And Nixon won't help anybody who sides with Russia. Why should he? That's a language even these guys. Let's go to the next one. Even they, they understand. Okay? Why is Nixon helping Israel? Because Russia helping us. You know, that's, any fool can get that. In fact, any help the Russia give the Arabs, Nixon's saying we will check it with countervailing su support to Israel, and you know, I'll see you. <laughs> like if you're playing a game of cards. Right? You, you, I'll give them more phantoms. So you give them more MiGs, I'll give them more phantoms. You give them more tanks, I'll give them more tanks. Not because I want to. If you didn't give it to them, I wouldn't give it to Israel. But you're giving it to them, so then don't get angry at me. You see? Um, and by the way, behind the scenes, let's put it this way, Nasser used to say like this, we're not going to restore relations with America unless America stops backing Israel. And Nixon said, oh, we'll take this into account. But behind the scenes, I guess, he broke relations with us because he lied. He said that we bombed Egypt during the Six-Day War. So now we have to go pay his lie? No, it wasn't going to work with Nixon. Uh, because the Israelis are better, is, Nixon feels he doesn't have to match the Russians in quantity, although Israel would prefer this. So if, if, if Russia gives him 100 MiGs, you know, and Nixon figures, and the Israelis figure, you know, 30, 40, 50 will cover it, you know, because the Jews can knock out two, three planes, or one, two, three. This basic idea, don't laugh at it, this basic idea is, here's your problem in the Yom Kippur War. The Israelis were cocky, overconfident, and had hubris. And so they figured, you know, five Israeli pilots can knock down 25 Egyptian pilots. Not so push it. Under certain circumstances, yes. Under other circumstances, no, as we will see. And not so push it. Uh, Nick and Moshe Dayan went all the time to Washington. And uh, again, he was smart enough when Nixon was out of office and he visited Israel, Dayan and Rabin gave him the VIP treatment, which meant a lot to Nixon because they say, see, they consider me Khashiv, even though. I'm not there. So you remember later on, look at this. This is right after the, um, uh, the Six-Day War, when Nixon was just a private citizen. This, made, this built him up in the public, and he knows all the leaders around the world. All that. So when Nixon got elected, Moshe Dayan went to see him, which is, of course, the famous uh, joke of yesteryear, uh, which I don't know if it's based or anything, but uh, Nixon, you know, America was losing all the time in the Vietnam. So Nixon said to Golda Meir, he says, give us your generals. <laughs> you know, they not win a war, one, two, three. And Golda Meir says, I'll switch two Israeli generals for two American generals. You get Moshe Dayan and Yitzhak Rabin. Who do you want? I want General Motors, General Dynamic, and General Electric. <laughs> you know, and here's Abi Ban, right? Is that right? Who also kept pounding that Israel needs more weapons. 
again, if you recall, Nixon said to Golda Meir, he says, look, we both, when, when he became Secretary of State, he says, now we both have Jewish foreign ministers. You have, uh, we, better, we have Kissinger. And Golda Meir says, yeah, but my speaks English without an accent. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it was a funny, a very funny relationship. And of course, when Golda Meir came, as she did all the time over there, she actually came with, with a, a shop, this is true, she came with a shopping list, you know, and instead of, it's not for pickles, you know, and, and butter, she said, I guess we need 30 uh, airplanes and 100 tanks and all the rest of it. In fact, Kissinger was, I mean, um, Kissinger, Nixon was already ready, you know, when he came to the office, he said, let me see your shopping list, you know, Sam? She said, I have it in my pocket, yeah. So, uh, this is a weird fact. This way of viewing the conflict through the Cold War terms therefore redounded to the benefit of Israel, which was the opposite of the State Department approach, which viewed the Arab-Israeli conflict in independent terms. Right, the State Department, this is uh, Ivan, of course, this is Cisco, the Assistant Secretary of State, who was a good guy, was not at all anti-Israel, it's very interesting. He was the number two in the State Department, then and under uh, Kissinger as well, <coughs> Joseph Cisco, California guy, not Jewish, uh, very capable diplomat, and he really understood Israel and, and so forth. I mean, I'm saying it in a, in a good way, but the State Department can't help it. They say like this, the Arab-Israeli conflict is one of the problems in the world. How do we go and, 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 and solve it? So we set up a team and they offer proposals, and the State Department would just issue, you know, we now have the Rogers plan, and now we have this new plan, and can we get the proximity talks, and can we get this all going? And, you know, Nixon kept saying like this, it's, I'm not ready for it all. So they just run on their own bureaucratically. And so what Nixon and Kissinger classically end up doing was telling the Israelis, don't pay attention to what the State Department is doing. You see? When Golda Meir got off the plane, this is true, in late 1970, uh, who was it? Somebody from the staff of Kissinger was there to say, President Nixon wants you to publicly criticize the State Department. <laughs> you see? Because, you know, they're causing him trouble. So, I mean, you know, Golda Meir must have figured what's going on over here. But that's the way Nixon liked to operate, you know, with the, 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 in, in his uh, system. And so uh, I personally think that uh, this was Kissinger's way of, of justifying to himself a pro-Israeli policy of some sort uh, with a hard-nosed realist like Nixon. He could always say, listen, we're backing Israel. We're supporting America in the, uh, in the Cold War. You understand? And so uh, even though it looks like you're you know, uh, giving all the extra attention to Golda Meir, really it's the assertion of American national interests, okay? We, we, we can move on from that. Now, by 1972, um, things got very complicated. It was a very complicated year for the Middle East. Four very big things were taking place in an uncoordinated fashion. Number one, Nixon is doing the detente in a big way. Okay, I mean, he's in, in China, in Russia, you know, that's one whole thing that was going on in that year. Number two, the Vietnam War was raging like crazy, and uh, they were, it was already known that Kissinger was negotiating in Paris with the North Vietnamese, and if you recall, in October, they thought, Mamish, this is it. They, they came this close to getting a, a peace agreement, so that's preoccupying everybody. You know, how much time does Kissinger, for example, and Nixon spend on the Vietnam thing? A ton. And how much did he spending on Russia and China? A ton. And then, of course, it was, uh, it was election year. And then Sadat, the president of Egypt, surprised everybody in the middle by kicking out the Russians. Russia had 20,000 uh, technicians and things like that in Russia. And Sadat said like this, uh, if I kick out the Russians, that'll get the attention of Nixon. He'll back me. Uh, so uh, what a year. Now, Sadat had been, fr and, and Nixon wasn't going to go against Israel in election year. Sadat had been frustrated by his ability to attract Nixon to his cause. The fact the State Department agreed with Sadat, he saw it didn't mean anything. You know, Rogers, the Secretary of State, was a nobody. The only ones who matter, the Egyptians are learning, everybody knew, was Nixon and Kissinger. And it was clear that Nixon followed the advice of Kissinger. But Kissinger, during this year, is juggling so many balls, he didn't have time to invest in the Middle East settlement. Sadat intuited, slightly, but he intuited, that Kissinger was necessary as a shadchan. And that turned out to be exactly true. What is a shadchan? The boy, the girl, it can work. 
but you know he's eh, and she's saying this. She thinks she won't move. He's saying he won't this. Da, da, da. If you leave it on them, it won't happen. But if you have the right shotgun, he'll talk to her. He'll talk to her. He'll say you said this. You really mean this. So it takes the active intervention, does it not, of a good shotgun to make something work. You usually cannot leave it to the principals, even though they're the main ones that account. As long as there's not, or there wasn't, a competent shotgun, Sadat realized, the principals can't tie the knot. Egypt wants to get back to Sinai, but they can't help themselves from also claiming the West Bank. Israel is kind of really ready to get rid of Sinai if Egypt will sign a separate treaty but not include the Palestinian issue. How much does Sadat really, you know, like, what's his non-negotiable stuff versus his negotiable stuff? Sadat thought, had thought, that dramatically kicking out the Russians would capture the rapt attention of Nixon, but it didn't. Not in 1972 when he's got so many balls to juggle. But little by little, Sadat did develop an approach to Kissinger through Sadat's own Kissinger, Hafiz Ismail, who was his, like, his personal assistant for, for uh, foreign affairs, the same equivalent. And he says eventually, look, um, forget the State Department, the Egyptian Foreign Ministry, all the rest of it. Can we have a secret negotiation, just you and me? That was the language that, uh, you know, that, 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 that was understood to work. I mean, how did, here you have the famous, uh, I don't know if you remember this, probably not. This is Gerard Smith, who was America's expert on the arms control. And he negotiated, ever since Sir Truman, he negotiated all the stuff with the Russians. But it turns out that the negotiations he had with the Soviets in Vienna in 1969, 70, and 71, into 72, were not at all what the SALT Treaty looked like, because he wasn't told that behind the scenes, Nixon is negotiating with the Brennan in Washington and coming up with an entirely different deal. So the American administration of Nixon was a classic example of going behind the back. That's what they like to do. So Sadat said, like, so let's do that. I just want to get back my land. Um, Kissinger is not eager to engage in Shadchanis because he doesn't believe that either Egypt or Israel is prepared to be non-maximalist. Moshe Dayan is, but not Israel so much. So uh, what I mean specifically is that Sadat had said, among other things, just as a very temporary business, maybe Israel will pull back from the canal, keep the rest of the Sinai for a moment, reopen the Suez Canal, and then we'll continue negotiations with them to do it. And uh, Moshe Dayan said that's not a bad idea because if Egypt opens the canal, it'll be in their economic interest not to start a war. Uh, and Golda Meir was thinking, maybe it's an idea. But Sadat said only if it's immediately followed by negotiations and the rest of the Sinai. And Golda Meir said, oh, no, we're not ready for that. So it's mamash a shidduch, isn't it? You know, the boy says under no circumstances this, the girl says under no circumstances that, but really they might. So it's tricky. Uh, meanwhile, it was election year, and Nixon, of course, and politicians had to be demonstrably friendly. They showed this all over the Jewish communities in America, this next video. Boy, he lays it on thick. You don't have to hear the whole thing. You know, there's two politicians laying on for each other. Um, and surprise, surprise, in January of 72, Nixon announced he's going to sell 52 Phantoms. That's a lot. That was the number one plane, wasn't it? It's a Tachlis already, you know. Uh, that, that, that's a significant uh, increase in Israel's uh, uh, Air Force. But after the elections were over in 72, in, in November, Nixon now wants to pressure Israel and Egypt to make a shidduch. It's, you know, they don't have to fake it anymore. I want to remind you, from Nixon's point of view, he's not doing anything wrong to Israel. Early in 73 now, Kissinger meets secretly with this Egyptian guy, Hafez Ismail. The back channel starts to take its first hesitant steps. But he says to Egypt, are you ready for a full peace treaty? Is it right? I mean, bottom line, if I get Israel pulled out, what do you say? Are you going to make peace? And he says to Israel, secretly, are you ready? Pull out of the whole Sinai Peninsula, Shalchanis. Sh and what's going to be with the Palestinians? And what's going to be with the right of return? And what's, what, what's the plan for the Kotel? 
and all the rest of it. Now these are touchy issues on both sides. If the Arabs say they'll make a full peace, Nixon and Kissinger are ready to put heavy pressure on Israel. As I said before, Nixon felt that the Israelis are taking advantage of American charity and they're being overly stubborn if you get full peace. Theoretically, theoretically, Nixon should have been all-powerful after his landslide. Theoretically, he should have been strong enough to pressure Israel in 73, the way Eisenhower pressured Ben-Gurion in 56 to pull out of the Sinai. This would have meant a deal with Jordan. They go back to the old borders. So you'd go back to the 67 borders with a complete real peace. That was the idea of what they're talking about. Aye, it's very vulnerable for Israel. He's like, but if you have a full peace treaty with the proper guarantees, then what's your problem? Um, Nixon reaches the peak of his strength in the immediate aftermath of the 72 elections. If you recall, he successfully bombs North Vietnam and secures a peace agreement. Right? And this really started the world agog. Uh, does anybody remember when they said they're actually going to make an end to the war, sort of? Uh, Nixon ends the draft. He starts bringing home the POWs. Do you recognize who this is? John McCain. Right? This is in North Vietnam. They started letting the prisoners go back to America. Okay? And this was all on the, uh, on the scenes. Right? Let's go to the next one. Yeah, so John McCain is going to Nixon. Look, look how gaunt he was from the thing, you know, the, from, the, from the Hanoi. And all over America, was, the news was the emotional returns. Let's go to the next one. Nine years. All right. So, in other words, there was a lot of emotional uh, business going on. My favorite um, perspective of this is what John McCain said in uh, 2008. In case you missed it, a few days ago, Senator Clinton tried to spend one million dollars on the Woodstock Concert Museum. <laughs> now, my friends, I wasn't there. I'm sure it was a cultural and pharmaceutical event. <laughs> I, was, I was tied up at the time, but the fact is, Famous moment in American politics. Um, but it's not so simple. As soon as the election's over, Watergate starts. Watergate, as we all know, is like a small little cancer, little by little weak in Nixon, that will increasingly preoccupy him. Meanwhile, Nixon, as the Watergate was building up, was doing great with the Russians, meaning SALT II, SALT III, all this business. And, uh, and Brezhnev uh, came uh, to uh, uh, America. You know, Nixon had gone in 72. Brezhnev came in 73. I think I showed you this last year. Uh, they're pressuring Nixon to agree to the Arab position because they want to show that Russia can deliver. And uh, Nixon and Brezhnev buddied up. Do you remember this scene from the Camp David um, conference in June of 73 already? This is a uh, dramatization with actors. These are actors.
you know, he, he collected cars. So Nixon and Brezhnev actually got along very, very had a very tight uh, relationship <laughs> at this, and then he took him to Hollywood. You understand? If you remember, took him to Hollywood for for a party with all the stars. So Brezhnev thought he's in 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 a hedon, <laughs> hedonist heaven. You understand? All the people, you know, he hugged John Wayne and the, the, all the actresses and things like that. Fine, everything's great. That night, in the middle of the night, he was sleeping at, Kiss, at uh, Nixon's house in San Clemente. That night, like two in the morning, Nixon is awoken. He said, Brezhnev wants to see you immediately. It's an emergency. Nixon is all, you know, uh, groggy and so forth. He's so Russian. And he comes upstairs to Brezhnev. The whole gang is there, Brezhnev and Gromyko and this, that, and the other. Put pressure to sign against Israel. And in the Russian way, they give him something to drink, you know, uh, vodka and things like that. And you know, agree, 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 agree to what Egypt wants, and Israel should do this, and let's issue a joint uh, statement against Israel. And the Zionists are super aggressive. All the rest. Look what a bunch of. Anyhow, um, Nixon was a punch drunk. All the rest said, but he did not give in. He said, "I'm not signing anything." He said, "Hold the line." But plans on pressuring Israel, Nixon does on general principles. The American press started in that year to turn on Israel. One well-known newspaper is a, actually came out and said the proper policy now is 
to stick it to Israel and turn to screw. The name of this national newspaper was? The Baltimore Sun. Oh, are you shocked? <laughs> okay. Um, Kissinger said very famously, Israel chased the illusion it could acquire territory and achieve peace. The Arabs chased the illusion they could regain territory without offering peace. That's where it stood. But Israel cannot be threatened, Nixon agrees, until after the Israeli elections of October of 73. Israel was supposed to have parliamentary elections, 1973, and he didn't want to mess up his girlfriend, right? He said, you know, I don't want the right-wing nuts like Begin and, and, and the Likud over here, which had started to gain power. That'd be a nightmare. Uh, this is the one we're betting on. So don't put any pressure on Israel until October of 1973. Um, actually, though, in the meantime, Nixon and Kissinger are plotting, because that's what they like to do. Okay, And their plots involve the ambassador to Washington, Yitzhak Rabin, whose uh, yard site is very soon. And uh, Rabin, of course, had been the general in the 60 war, getting near the end now. And he was ambassador to the United States ever since 68. He got very close with Kissinger and Nixon. You know, Nixon admired him because he was a successful general, and nobody thought Rabin would be successful in the ambassador position, but he was. However, it's an interesting uh, situation because as you get to know Nixon, all these guys, and give the Israeli point of view over, what's happening? You're also hearing the American point of view. So as he's trying to Israelize them, he's getting Americanized himself. It's not the first or the last time something this happened. So as he maneuvers to make Nixon understand Israel's case, Rabin is seduced by frequent conversations with Nixon and Kissinger, and they plot to have Rabin return to Israel, get elected, succeed Golda Meir after the October elections, and lead Israel towards the necessary territorial uh, concessions. This was the plan. Um, all they had to do was wait for the elections of October, because Rabin resigned and went back to Israel in the summer of 1973. But as we kind of all know, Israel did not have elections in October of 1973, did they? Uh, for unexpected reasons. That is something you'll have to stay tuned for in two weeks. There's no <laughs> lecture next week. I do want to remind you that, uh, as Ari's telling me over here, if anybody wants a copy of the itinerary, um, you have it over here. we have a really great program. We're going to be in an army base, and we're going to be at the Mushabot, and we're going to be in the Shamron. We have a special thing in Yerushalayim. It's uh, quite, quite, quite a business. And good luck. <laughs>